Every church sings about grace. Every church talks about grace. Every church talks about a God of love. Every church does that. <laughs> Everybody doesn't believe it. They really don't. With a lot of people, it's just, it's just lip service. In a, lot of, in a lot of places where you hear the gospel preached, it's an extraordinarily judgmental, rough kind of thing. Everybody says that God is good, but everybody doesn't believe that God is good. They say that God is good, but that God can sometimes do some awfully mean things. Well, that's not, that's not the gospel. If someone tells you that God has done something mean or that God has made a mistake or that God is a rough customer to deal with, you know they're not telling you the truth and they're getting that from somewhere where they shouldn't be getting whatever they're getting. I've been thinking lately about the book of Revelation. You know that because I've written a couple of little articles about the book of Revelation and they go into the newsletter. So even if you don't take the Star-Telegram, You've probably read them, and I'm going to read one of them to you now, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of the response which I've gotten uh, to this article about the book of Revelation. The final decision of the Council of Hippo in 397, now none of us were there at that time except Keith. Keith remembers it, and he'll do a report on that for us next week. If Keith were not doing great at his age, I wouldn't be able to joke about it in 397 was to include the book of Revelation in the canon of the Bible, and it was a mistake, I said. Can you believe I said that? I said it was a mistake to include. Do I think it should be taken out now? No, no, no. The Bible's been the way it is for 2,000 years nearly. Uh, it needs to stay the way it is. But I said it was a mistake that they made. And after that, it has been hard to get Christians to listen to the teachings of Jesus and the Gospels. Our natural inclination is toward revenge, and the book of Revelation is a book of revenge. It is both, in it, both God and his son are, are rough customers. God, uh, poor, uh, God pours out bowls of wrath on the earth and sends fire and earthquakes. And Jesus rides in on a white horse with a sword in his mouth and he cuts off the heads of his enemies. And that's it. That's the undoing of the image of God we have in the Gospels. And I go on to say that people have to make a choice. We have to make choices when we read the Bible. If we don't, we're going to be in a theological mess. And I'm telling you that probably a majority of Christians are in a theological mess. I say, so Christians face a choice. They must choose the bowls of wrath or grace. They must choose a Jesus who cuts off the heads of his enemies or a Jesus who dies for his enemies, and from time to time all of us are his enemies, dies for his enemies on the cross. You can't have both. Our blessed Lord said, you cannot serve two masters. If you do, it's going to make you what the little book of James in the Bible called double-minded. You believe one thing, you say you believe one thing, but in reality, you believe something else. And you end up with a theology that is just simply a mess. Now, let me share with you some of the responses that I got uh, to that little article when I put it in the paper. This one says, uh, well, I'll read, I'll read you this one first. Uh, every time you, I read you col your column, I'm enlightened. Thank you for doing what, what you do. 
etc., uh, etc. Et it says some nice things. That's from Randy Jordan, uh, our friend and former choir director from the early 1980s. I hear from Randy occasionally in response to the little columns. Now here's one from someone who says, Max, I said two points, two points. Max, I appreciate your column and agree Jesus wants us to love the un ungrateful and to love the wicked and the morally and spiritually bankrupt. He might even be able to use them in his plan for us. Number two, Revelation is a mystery to me. But if we eliminate the books of the Bible that we have a problem with, books that people take out of context, I don't think we would have many books left in the Bible. Well, no, I'm not saying take it out of the Bible, but nobody's taken the book of Revelation out of context. And it's not as mysterious as it seems. It's written in symbols. It purports to tell the future. And what I'm telling you today is, and this is going to be hard for you, for some of you, you need to get all of that future that it predicts out of your mind. Don't sit around waiting to get raptured. You ain't ever going to fly out of these pews. Okay? There's a whole movie about, uh, what is it, left, left behind? Because God purportedly takes the church out of the world, takes all of the church out of the world, and people don't know whether they're actually part of the church until they start flying up off the earth. And you remember those, they showed, they showed those cars that didn't have anybody in them and the car would just run off the road because the church had been raptured, you know? And why does he do that? He leaves everybody else behind so he can be as mean to them as he wants to. Okay? That ain't the way it's going to work. That's not reality. God has always given us freedom he gave those who put the Bible together freedom to make choices. And they chose for their own reasons after a, after a couple of centuries of argument over it, or at least one century, to put in the book of Revelation. But it's not where we get our theology, okay? Yeah, it's historically valuable. But it's not where we get what we believe about God. If you, if you do that, you're not going to believe in the God that Jesus talked about. The God that Jesus talked about is so radically loving that he is still unacceptable to most Christians today. That's how loving he was. He got crucified because he was so loving, if you want to know why he ended up dying on the cross. Okay, let me show you something. What is this? It's a stool. It's a particular kind of stool. It's a joint stool, okay? Joint stools are actually mentioned in the works of Shakespeare because it's what everybody sat on. Now, this isn't quite as old as Shakespeare. He was 400 years ago. This is only 300 and something years ago. But it's what most people sat on. I really like it. It's interesting. But do you think I sit on this to watch television? No, children. I sit in my green, fluffy chair that kicks back and lets me relax. I don't sit on a joint stool. Well, why do I have it? Because it's an interesting historical object. No, I'm not going to throw it away because it's no longer useful as a chair. It's interesting. That's the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is very interesting, and there are some, there are some flights of poetry in there. And there's some great drama in there. There is nothing, nothing in there that you can take home and live on 
about Jesus Christ. I really can't think of much of anything. Here I got another response. I hope she doesn't mind me reading this. This is from uh, Ginger Watson, another United Methodist minister, and she's the pastor of Meadowbrook Poly United Methodist Church. And Ginger, by reading this today, I hope I don't ruin your reputation. Uh, dear Reverend Max, just a note to thank you for your article in the Star Telegram explaining that Revelation is wrong about God. I've had several, several permissions parishioners come to me asking about your article, and I have said, Max is absolutely right, and he has the courage to say it. Actually, it doesn't take any courage. It doesn't take any courage. It should not take any courage for a minister to tell the truth. It shouldn't take any courage for a politician to tell the truth, but you know, that can sometimes be impossible. But a minister should be expected to tell the truth wherever it lands. Put it out there, okay? If it's true, it's true, and if it's a lie, it's a lie. I recently heard Mark Driscoll, Mark Driscoll, bless his heart, someone wants a, a group of people that he was ministering to. He has a large church now, has had for years. The one church threw him out, said he's unfit to be pastor of anybody, but he just keeps on going. I recently heard Mark Driscoll going on and on about how Jesus wasn't going to be a victim anymore because he's coming back with a sword to take his revenge. That's not the Jesus I know, and you know it's not the Jesus you know. And she talked about having listened to that sermon. She said, Ugh, there's some precious moments in my life I'll never get back. You're so right about that view of Christ being a favorite for a certain bent of evangelicals, so thank you for getting this out into the public discourse. I want you to know that I'm just not all by myself in saying and thinking these things. There are other people like me who are right. <laughs> okay. I I I let, let me read you a bit of scripture. It's another one of those interesting bits of scripture. And uh, I'll ask you, you know, what, what should we do with it? This is from 2 Kings, and it's a story about Elisha. Elisha was one of the great prophets of the Old Testament. From where Elisha was, he went up to Bethel. And as he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town, and they jeered at him. Get out of here. Old Baldy, they said. Get out of here, Old Baldy. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord God. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. And he went on to Mount Carmel. Didn't think much about it. What do you do with that? <laughs> that's kind of a fun old story. My sister and I have talked about the fact that that's, that's like the kinds of things that uh, our family used to try to scare us with when we were doing something we shouldn't. They would tell us that uh, raw-headed bloody bones would get us. That's a term that goes back hundreds of years. Most, most of you have never even heard of it but it's actually been passed. You've heard of it? Raw-headed bloody bones. It's sometimes raw head and bloody bones if you look back in, in records a couple of hundred years ago. My Aunt Effie, when Charlotte, my cousin Charlotte and I were riding our tricycles and there was an area in the back that was cleared that was just dirt around the back door. And just beyond that area, there was, uh, uh, there was grass. And when we got in the grass, we always got chiggers, okay? So she said, listen, you two, I want you to ride your bicycle just on this 
cleared area on this dirt. She says, if you get on the grass, just below the grass is the devil. And the devil will stick his pitchfork up into your tricycle tires and might even hit you just below the ground. Same kind of story. That one made it into the Bible. And people try to defend it. I had some called by the bears. No, it's not. Can't you simply grab hold of the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, who said that God loves all of us infinitely and unconditionally and at all times, and can't you simply say, hey, <laughs> that may be in the Bible, but it don't sound like the Jesus I know. And we all, it doesn't make reading the Bible hard. If you know who he is, you also know who he is not. And by the way, if I preach this sermon in many, many churches, you wouldn't be hearing the end of it. I'd be already be marched out the door after the first few sentences. You know that's true. That's the kind of shape the church is in. The church does not, and in many instances has not, listened to the Lord Jesus Christ. And only if we listen to him first will we get it right. And if we do listen to him first, I promise you, we will get it right. In a moment, we're coming to this table. We're going to take that bread and juice of the one who said to us, this is me. This is my body. I'm giving it for you. Not because you deserve it, but because I love you. Join me in prayer. Dear gracious Lord, we thank you for loving us. Forgive us when we have failed to hear you about God's love for us. And in this moment now, dear gracious God, help us to recommit ourselves and our lives to you and to let you take us into the shelter of your arm.